Kia ora tato. I'm Kirsty Farkas, and Elizabeth and I are going to talk to you today. Um, I just wanted to say hello to start. We're doing some of the slides each. I wanted to thank Adam for setting such a fabulous scene for what we're going to talk about. Sadly, our slides aren't quite as gorgeous as his, but a lot of the themes that he identified come, came through in this project we're going to talk about, which is working with the education sector and how to use um, um, artefacts and collections of the glam sector. Kia ora koutou. Um, Thanks, Kirsty. Um, I'm Elizabeth Jones, and it's great to be here with one of the partners. So Kirsty and I are representing um, two of the partners, but there are actually a number of others. And I think in the audience, we've probably got some of the people who are involved from Ministry of Culture and Heritage as well, uh, as well as others. Um, so uh, what was this project about? Which way is it? Um, it was about, first of all, resources of all types. Although it was called increasingly digital, it actually was an, um, a really an attempt to think about digital alongside every other kind of resource. Place, people, physical, multi-sensory resources, print, uh, and to really explore this question. So there were two big parts to the um, project. This question and the, uh, creating the space for collaborative practice. Uh, in a way that in, in some cases was quite radical because we were using a lot of different lenses to explore this question. So um, what is it, oops, just trying to see here, uh, what, why, what and why of this question? So um, as Kirsty said, it was really interesting to hear what Adam had to say and in fact a lot of the other speakers because we were really approaching it from a different perspective at a time when uh, most young people are actually overwhelmed and inundated with information. There's no shortage of information and knowledge and learning resources. Um, in many ways they're actually kind of drowning in a bit of a digital sea. Um, we wanted to really explore, is it about creating more and more content, or should we try and understand how teachers and students actually go about discovering and accessing content, but more importantly, how do they use it, and what is the role of resources in taking you beyond being informed to really asking deeper questions, to be inspired to do something. So this was really about, in a way, coming to the other side and looking at engagement and learning. Um, we did decide to focus it in on uh, Aotearoa New Zealand resources because um, that is of growing interest to the education sector and is something that connected all three of the partners, Ministry of Culture and Heritage, Ministry of Ed, and of course National Library. Um, I should say there were a number of other partners, including our research partner, the New Zealand Council for Educational Research, and also we had the involvement of New Zealand RISE and New Zealand Tech, particularly Ed Tech. Um, so uh, why does this why does this matter, this question? For all of us, we're really conscious that we provide resources in different ways. Uh, the whole ecosystem surrounding resources is pretty fragmented. There are many channels, they don't necessarily reference each other. Uh, for many schools, and we know this from our own experience, Despite the wealth of knowledge and resources, there can be classrooms that never get beyond the very surface level of Google. So we really felt we had a responsibility to do a better job in looking at how we could work together in dialogue and with schools and Kura to look at what are the key barriers and the opportunities and how can resources and content be much more powerful in the lives of young people. So that really led us onto the uh, nature of the project. So there were five work streams. Uh, the first one was to actually work directly with schools and kura. Um, and that was interesting in itself because we were working with secondary, primary, large, small, urban, rural, and also bringing Māori medium and English together, which quite um, is not that common. Um, and that involved um, supporting them actually out there in their communities, but also bringing people together for hui, along with experts and people from other agencies to really explore the power of, of resources. And in this case, we did it at National Library. Um, 
but it also meant actually involving them in the design and thinking about what they really needed. So that was one part of it, um, and those case studies have been written up by the New Zealand Council for Educational Research and that will be available. Then there was a survey. So the case studies were a deep dive. The survey was to ask more broadly, what do you need, teachers? Where do you go? What are the barriers? What do you not feel confident about? How do you feel about teaching New Zealand story, New Zealand history and histories of Aotearoa? Um, what is your use of libraries? Where do you actually get resources from? So that gave us a snapshot across the country. Uh, the third one is about just checking my order, resource development in Te Reo and English. So we didn't do a lot. This was not about creating a lot of content, but we did want to actually work together to see what are the kinds of content, what are the kinds of formats that might be really useful and engage teachers and students from current schools in that. Um, and interestingly, one of the key things is a lot of that was not about digital, which we'll come back to. Um, the fourth piece was resource research um, and development. So that was looking at the data. We looked at where are people coming from, looking at key sites, looking at what are they asking for, what terms do they use, what kind of connection is there across different sites, like National Library, Tara, uh, what's happening with TKI, which is the Ministry of Ed's portal. So that was, uh, we really only starting to scratch the surface of what's starting to come through that. We were lucky to have the um, support and expertise of Chris McDowell working on that project. Um, and some exciting stuff there. We also used the opportunity to um, have a look at students' experience by using transcripts of the Any Questions service, which is a different thing. That was less about uh, kind of big data and more about small data. It was actually looking at the emotional experience of young people when they are trying to find uh, content, their frustrations, their relief, their anxieties, their confusions, and that was a really interesting piece of work that we will also build on. Um, and the last one was to explore future learning environments. We are still doing that. That's about trying to, we did a lot around utopias and dystopias, but really it's about how can we leverage everything that we're doing in real dialogue with um, everyone who really wants to be powered to, to learn and to be inspired to contribute to their communities and to have more flourishing futures. We need to do better as a system. Um, so those were the uh, components. Uh, very, very quickly, I won't go through all of these, um, but these are some of the initial findings. Huge variation between schools. Some of that was about access and confidence um, and even and awareness and even kind of a sense of it being valuable at all. Um, a lot of that came down to not actually having had the opportunity. There were also big differences between uh, Kura in particular, who were very strong in using place and people, so very good at place-based pedagogy, but very le much less likely to use digital and print, as opposed to the um, most of the mainstream schools who are more confident uh, with some of the existing tools and resources that our agencies provide, but often still at a very surface level. Um, so one of the big things was absolutely improving discoverability. Um, I guess the big thing is, don't think put it out there and they will come. Actually, they're not coming, um, really. And an awful lot of time poor teachers and students and go and look this up and they are on Google, you know, which gives them the illusion of ultimate um, access and they really never find the, a lot of the great stuff. So um, a lot of it was about actually really being out there in those communities. It was the importance of the personal connection to make the content relevant uh, was a big part of it. So it's not just improving discoverability across websites, it was also br really bringing it into the lived learning experience of those kids. Um, so that led also to the idea of a real value around curation and tools that actually putting a whole lot of stuff out there and people finding it, um, there was a real interest in having experts, if you like, or people whose job it is to work in this area to really model and exemplify and create tools and scaffolding to help busy teachers um, actually really come across great stuff and be able to use it well. Um, uh, what else? Uh, that also related to the difficulty for both teachers and students in, in terms of really good research skills 
and uh, a lot of that is shown up in the data as well. In terms of resources, one of the big takeaways is we don't just want digital in an increasingly digital environment, we want print, multi-sensory, we want artifacts, we want people, we want places. And it really confirmed this idea of a very rich kind of ecosystem of knowledge sources and resources and led to a lot of discussion about um, the idea of when is print, for example, the perfect format for a particular kind of learning? When is, when is digital really good? When is it um, the most powerful thing is to actually go outside and think about what you're doing in the local environment? So a lot of the discussion was around that, which led us to really consider where digital sits as a kind of amplifier around um, to make all of that both more powerful and to take learners further. Um, the very strong uh, message, which won't be new to probably anyone here, about the need for developing content resources from a Maturanga uh, Māori perspective and not translated. That was particularly strong with the Kura, who very much their whole uh, kopapa in, in terms of how they learn is based on uh, very much um, their worldview and a Māori knowledge system. Um, there was also clear uh, challenges around the lack of resources generally in Te Reo Māori and also a lack of resources at a junior level generally, um, particularly at the, in the digital space. Um, the other thing was local-based learning. So again, this is not new, but it's, I think it's becoming more important. If we think about things like the treaty or um, um, tuia, what communities, what students and teachers both said they mostly wanted was hyper-local. So they wanted access to the personal narrative, the lost stories, the things that connected their community, their school, their, their own lives to that event. And I think there's huge opportunity there to see what we can do as a sector uh, in making those stories come to life. Um, that was a really strong uh, piece of feedback. And finally, just to say, questions are the key technology. So the really important part of uh, what it means to have really rich, powerful, open-ended questions at the forefront of learning. So it's not about providing content and you've got all the stuff you need. It's about um, actually what is the really rich question here that actually is in itself the catalyst and the motivator to go deeper and further. That came through really, really strongly. Um, I'll hand over to Kirsty, but just to say, and you probably you won't really be able to see this, but this is just a glimpse of um, the search behavior stuff. We've got many of these uh, visualizations. Um, the one there, that which is about looking at the analytics and where people are coming from. The exploring student experience one is showing, using emoticons, what was going on for students as they were interacting with an online, online librarian trying to um, fulfill their information needs. And I will hand over to Kirsty. So, as Elizabeth said, we made a few resources during this project in response to what the kura and schools told us. Um, and Elizabeth also mentioned that particularly the kura wanted really hyper-local stories. So we teamed up there. They wanted to tell stories. We, the, we worked with some kura up in Northland. They wanted to tell some stories of some Napuhi tupuna. So we helped them with that and then produced the biographies um, digitally. That enabled, the digital access meant that a local story could be shared more broadly with other Napuhi throughout the country. Um, and also, in the digital version of it had an audio track, so that helped address, address that issue that Elizabeth mentioned of having content that was accessible for younger audiences who might not yet have very highly developed literacy skills. Um, so that was a very local resource that we developed for Māori Medium. For English Medium, in talking with schools, what they said that they would really help them would be examples of how to use particular artefacts. So we made what we called these curiosity cards, which are actually a print resource, but it is also available online. There it is. <laughs> on the National Library website. So they had on the front some 
images from the National Library collection. And on the back, they had some questions, which are called fertile questions. And you may or may not have come across the concept of fertile questions before. But those are those very powerful questions that Elizabeth referred to, um, that really are very open-ended. They really support inquiry learning and get the students to think beyond just what's the content that I, that I have to consume. One of the things that came through when we talked to schools is the danger of Google. And when students think that learning is Googling something and then cutting and pasting that into the essay, you know, that's not learning at all. That's just learning information transfer, but it's not learning to think. It's not developing cognitive skills, problem solving skills. It's not really developing much depth of knowledge about what that content means for me, for my community, for where I stand, for what my personal history is. So if you've not come across first questions before on the National Library website there's some videos in the services to schools section um, and Indira talks about what fertile questions are and they're a wonderful way to get students thinking in quite kind of creative and destabilizing um, ways. Um, also on the fertile questions there's a link to the Digital New Zealand um, website which Adam also mentioned is a great way of uh, content being shared through a variety of different channels. So what did we learn from what did we learn from this project? We've got a few slides about project insights. Um, Elizabeth said that we worked a bit on future thinking methodologies, and what we found in those future thinking methodologies is that usually what you think is going to happen on the in the future depends on what you believe in now. So if you listen to tech companies who usually get quite a lot of airtime about the future, they're talking about the technical future because that's what they believe in and that's what their business is. Um, so one has to be aware of the biases of future predictions and futurists. The things that we thought were really important was the government's stewardship role. So in the Ministry of Education, <clears throat> it's not possible for us to provide all the content that a student needs as they go through ed their education pathway. And we certainly can't do it without institutions like you, who are such key content partners for the education sector. Where the government does have an important role is in making sure that schools and students can access the content. Um, so we will continue to have a, have a role in that. You'll be well aware of the demographic predictions about New Zealand continuing to become more diverse, and so therefore we need to provide more diverse perspectives, more diverse content um, that's meaningful to those audiences. You'll also not be surprised that um, Te Ao Māori, Te Reo Māori is going to continue to um, increasingly shape New Zealand and we need to make sure that our education system and the resources that we can provide can, can respond to that. And certainly um, we found in some of the resources that we've been producing more recently, um, we need to turn the dial and increasingly show more of a, a Māori perspective rather than just a Crown or Pākehā perspective. And that can be particularly important for institutions that are seen as government or Crown institutions that might have a particular um, a biased view. For those of you who work in museum education, you'll be familiar with the concept of full curriculum. The front of our curriculum is very much about 21st century skills, dispositional skills, social competencies. The back of the curriculum is about the traditional academic, area, um, academic subjects and learning areas. The, there's much more of a focus now on making sure students experience that full curriculum. So all that stuff about identity, belonging, contributing, working in teams, that kind of stuff. A lot of it is what the current government is picking up under the kind of well-being umbrella. Um, so that's going to become more and more important in education. And what's important for um, people or organisations that are repositories of content is that it's not just about transmission con transmitting content knowledge from an expert to a student, but rather how do they develop those skills about how to, deli to live successfully in society, know who they are, where they stand, and what their contribution is. Um, there's going to a continuous learning, a greater recognition of lifelong learning, that it's not as though students go through the education system and then get spat out and they stop learning, they, they're just doing. So how can um, key content collections support that? 
Um, equity, we increasingly need to really focus on trying to address social and e economic disparities. And in the selection of schools in Kura, we, we really made an effort to reach a great variety and learn from all of them, because they have quite different challenges, um, particularly the rural and remote schools in Kura have quite different challenges from the urban, well-connected um, schools, well-connected to institutions such as the glam sector, whereas the rural and remote are often really rich in their connections with their, their local community. Nature of knowledge, growing complexity. So certainly moving away from this idea that there is one right answer and supporting schools to have conversations about contested stories and contested histories. In some of our research around teaching New Zealand history, we found, and you probably won't be surprised to hear this, that a lot of teachers lack confidence in um, dealing with local history where there'll be different perspectives, there might be a sense of injustices that may or may not have been redressed. And so something like tu teaching Tudor history seems, or English history, se is much safer. But actually it's really important for our students that they are exposed to all those various different ideas and develop the skills in navigating them and working out what, why people have different perspectives and that they can all be va valid. We, the, one of the reasons that we partnered with both Museum for Culture and Heritage and the National Library is that really key role that the GLAM sector have in the learning infrastructure. And what we were want to, uh, trying to, to help understand is how we can better unlock the potential of those collections for education. And what came through really strongly, and won't be surprising for you either, is the importance of whānau and community connections, because they're the ones that have aspirations for their students, and also that's where a lot of the local, the local knowledge sits. So that was some of the stuff we, we found about the things we need to focus on in the future. We talked a bit about collaboration, and Adam talked about that in the previous session too. Collaboration has got heaps of potential, and we can collaborate at lots of different areas and at lots of different levels. But it's not always easy. And I think we possibly sailed into this thinking, oh, great, we're all interested in the same things. What a great opportunity to do this project together. And then we kind of got a bit surprised when we hit a few bumps. And some of the bumps were about. The fact that we have different drivers, so the, the National Library's got one, one kind of mandate, education's got a different mandate, culture and heritage have got a different mandate, the tech agencies who were our partners have slightly different drivers as well. So it was important for us to realise that tensions may have come from those slightly different drivers rather than it was dysfunctional or we were difficult to work with or whatever. It would have been quite easy to jump to those conclusions and walk off in a huff. In order to overcome those, the, the tension of different drivers was the importance of developing a shared vision of what we were trying to do together. Um, it takes resource and time. Collaboration does seem like a great idea. Um, I've got to wind it up. Collaboration seems like a great idea, but it takes lots of resource and time. I can see our indefatigable um, project manager, Emma, down there. Um, we had full-time resources on the collaboration project, so also be aware of that. Play to your strengths and learn from each other and learn from each other's expertise. What's coming up next, we hope we can learn, we can work together a bit more, but we need to get that signed off by CEs. Um, and I'll leave you, see, we've actually meant to wind up with a few of the voices from the, from the schools who took part in the, in the contract, in the project. And can I say just one thing very quickly as it's lunchtime, um, because there's lots in this project, um, both Kirsty and I would be really happy to talk to anyone or ask and answer any questions at lunch. Also, we will be on the National Library stand where we can show you some of both the online and the print material if you're interested. And I've just noticed that Emma, who was the project manager, was sitting in the audience and I didn't realise. So thanks to Emma, who did a lot of the corralling of this project. Thanks, everyone.